Yes. Right. Good morning. Thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Uh, it's a busy <coughs> cold day, so hopefully it's a little bit warmer inside than it is outside. Um, we would like to make a copy to the first thing big events. Um, we had a great idea about six weeks ago to put on an event in Liverpool <coughs> with um, a sales and marketing twist. Uh, we're basically focused around business growth, and this is the realisation of that crazy idea uh, those weeks ago. It's a collaboration between Elf and Digital, who are based in Liverpool City Centre on um, Hope Street, and um, with Lindsay from Access Marketing. Um, so we hope you enjoyed today's uh, event. We've got three speakers today, of which I'm one, so please bear with me for the final one. Um, and I'll let's crack on. So today is about, as I said, Lindsay's going to talk us through basically how the, the, the SMEs of the North West can compete with the bigger boys. That's basically what Lindsay's going to be focused on. She'll take through her sort of experience and her strategy and how she approaches that. Next, we have Michelle Finley from the LEP, who's going to take you through how to get free money. Say free money in inverted commas, which is not exactly free, but there's some great little tips there for accessing some, some of the money that are available by um, the Europe device and the council, etc. And at the end, I'm going to take you through uh, a little bit about how to actually implement the digital marketing strategies that Lindsay will talk about in the first session. Just very briefly, really, about what Finley uh, is and what it stands for, what we're trying to do. We thought there was a bit of a gap in the market, a cross between kind of a seminar and a networking style event. We are planning to put on about four to five seminars during the next 12 months. Um, some of them will be free, some will be, be paid for masterclasses. The idea is basically to give businesses in the North West a bit of an edge up over some of the effects around uh, the North England and around the rest of the UK. It's, it's a bit of a grand idea, but you know, it might just work. And uh, hopefully we'd like to uh, keep this uh, a running theme right through next year and beyond. It's a bit of a collaborative effort, so we are looking for ideas and thoughts, and uh, if you've got anything you think that might suit this style of events, if you'd like to speak, speak at the next thing big events, by all means let me know. If you've got ideas about other events that might suit this um, style of events, maybe in partnership, please again let me know, we're open to ideas. But in theory, it's, the, it's these kind of free events and some of the masterclasses that we're putting on during the next year. So first, I'm introducing Lindsay Moore, who's going to take you through some of her thoughts and experience around SME marketing. Um, right, hi, good morning everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's such an early start. I've had to go heavy on the eye makeup and I've not even come that far. So thank you for thank you for that. So um, like Phil said, I'm from Agnes and I um, well for the last 17 years I've been working for in businesses as part of their marketing departments and also within agencies supporting um, big brands basically in terms of their marketing strategies and their ideas and their communications <coughs> campaigns. And in the last few years, uh, by chance more than anything else really, I became involved in working with SMEs. Um, and I, I you know, it, it occurred to me that really business is business and it, if you're a one man band or if you're a huge conglomerate, there's principles that just apply to having effective marketing and it's not the sole it's not the ownership of big businesses to, to, to have that. Anyone can have it. And really, that's the basis of what I'm going to talk to you today. And when I talk to my clients and the, uh, small, medium-sized enterprises, effectively, I'm always asking them about the same five areas. And, um, you know, have you, got, have you got these things in place? Have you considered those? So that's really what I'm just going to share with you today, go over those five areas. So basically, it's targeting. It's who actually are you talking to? It sounds very basic, but in the, the, the busyness of day to day and just doing what you do, people can often lose focus on exactly who they're talking to. So I'm going to be talking to you about really being as narrow and deep as possible as you can on them. Um, be, putting yourself in a position where you're able to easily identify gaps and opportunities. Oh, okay. uh, opportunities and gaps in the market. Um, Really, the importance of certainly with SMEs, you're much closer than any big businesses are to their customers, and you're in a really strong position to be able to make your customers feel super special. Um, some ideas around that. Also, the you know the importance of how how you look and your image, because it's you know rightly or wrongly, perception is reality, and certainly in, in small business, and it's more important than ever for small businesses. So not just how you look, but also what your marketing toolkit looks like um, and what's in it. And also, again, to be to, to put yourself on the front foot in terms of being receptive 
and to ideas and being able to adapt quickly and move at pace, um, which SMEs have obviously got to their advantage. They can move much quicker than a, than a big business. I mean, I was talking to a business last week. Um, they, they are you know, sort of a larger SME, uh, but they're still in the SME bracket, and they are a distributor of car parts nationally, and they found that somebody was coming onto their patch in North Wales, and they're the market leader at the moment. And within two weeks, they had a loyalty scheme set up for their, for their customers, for their trade. It was, you know, they had sales packs ready to go. You know, a big company just cannot move at that pace. Uh, but as a smaller business, you can. Okay, so, um, okay, so the first point is who are you talking to? And when I speak to people, um, that often these are typical answers they'll get. So I'll have, well, I'm an accountant, so anyone paid that pays tax is a prospect for me. <coughs> or I sell office products, so anyone who's an office. Um, um, who has an office is my prospect, or I sell phone and internet services, so anyone who communicates is my uh, prospect. So, yes, while these statements are generally true, they're not <coughs> terribly helpful for companies who are wanting to raise. I'm not even touching that. Uh, <laughs> you're totally operating by my point. He's such a naughty boy. Uh, don't trust him. Uh, so, they're not particularly, you know, although these are true, they're not particularly helpful for companies wanting to raise the, the profile of themselves um, and their market share and their profits. So um, trying to be all things to all people is just inefficient and please don't do it. Um, the narrower and narrower and narrower you can get your target market, the more effective you're going to be. We haven't got, nobody has got the money to be so broad and narrow when it comes to talking to all of those people. So, um, to give you an example then, an IT services company, um, how they could start to narrow their funnel would be, like, they'll start off with saying, right, well, anyone who has an IT requirement is our customer, yeah, okay, take that off. Um, so companies that are interested in cloud-based IT services, okay, so they're narrowing it down a little bit, still a huge audience. Then they'll go, okay, well, within that, we're looking for IT managers, but also owners of businesses. So you're probably looking at smaller size businesses, potentially. And then they might say, well, actually, we want to think about it. We'll just focus on the legal market, because we've actually got a critical mass of clients in the legal market. We've got some more case studies around there, so we'll go to the legal market. And then they could go, well, actually, we'll just do it within a 50-mile radius. So all the time I'm saying, OK, how can you get it narrower, and how can you get it narrower, and how can you get it narrower? Because unless you, you almost want to get into the position where you can, you know, there's nothing elusive about that target market. You know that you understand that you can see them in your mind's eye. You know, ideally, you want to be able to see the whites of the eye, know them so well you can, you know, you know what colour underwear they've got on. You know, or it, <laughs> my boys have the case. Have you changed your underwear today? Which is my little sons. I don't. That's a whole other talk of its own. Right? I don't baffles me. I don't know. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, so, you know, define your narrow and deep, you know, think, just spend time thinking about that because that will <coughs> save you a whole lot of effort and make you much uh, more efficient, much more quickly. So, who's your broader audience? You know, if you've got a specific sector you're going at, whether it's legal or if you're a consumer, a consumer brand, is it more of a demographic? Profile, you know, is it is it is it children? Is it women? Is it who is it? If you've got a geographical focus, are you looking to so for example an accountancy company or, or sort of say a legal company who might sell a broad range of services? They might have well actually we do order and offer a lot of services, but actually the, but with this year or the first half of this year we're really going to push conveyancing. So again, don't be frightened of um, not bidding off some of your services, but just focusing on the ones that are key to you, that are going to make you the margin, or where the opportunity lies, or whatever it is. And also think of the benefit or focus, so for example, with the legal, the legal market example, for that uh, IT company, for example, if they're purely targeting legal companies, they can be much more message specific, they can much talk, more talk to them in their terms about changing regulations, and what this means for their IT, and, 
So you know you can see the benefits are very much uh, are very narrower and, uh, and deeper. Um, okay. So. Um, uh, right. Second point then. How how do you learn how to exploit gaps and weaknesses? Um, first of all, you've got to know you've, you've got to know your competitors. So. A lot of businesses I talk to, and it's, it's understandable because we all run our own businesses and we're consumed by the day to day and doing what you need to do to get through and deliver your deadlines. But you need to know who your competitors are because if you don't know who your competitors are, you don't know if you're competing. Um, and, and again, when I ask people and say, Who are your competitors? they'll go, Oh, they're well, these and these and these, and they've got an idea of who they are. Um, but again, go narrower and deeper into those competitors and be aware that often your competitors aren't actually the people you know about. They're the people that you don't know about and that are going to come from behind. And before you know it, they've got your market share off you. Um, so, and, and, and also, how do you do that? Well, you know, we're fortunate now that we've got a number of, a number of ways that we can spy our competitors <coughs> and know what we're up to. Twitter is a hugely you know, useful <laughs> tool to be able to keep up to date with what other people are doing. LinkedIn, you know, obviously we've always had trade shows and trade press, and um, I suppose sometimes you can be like the sky and off a bit if you're, if, you're, if you're clicking through the trade press and you're thinking, well, should we do the work? But actually, that is really, really important that you know who your competitors are. And I, I advise my clients to have somebody internally within the business that reports back on their competitors regularly. You know, ideally a month, every month, coming in and doing a briefing on, like, this, these are the competitors, these are the watch outs, these are new technologies that they've got coming out, or this is an event, this is an area that they're in that we're not in there. And even if you look into that technology or that new area that they're going into and, and discard it, you know about it, so you're not on the back foot, you're on the front foot. So what it means, but like, understand what it means to be their customer. So once you've identified who your main competitors is, are, and not in a broad sense, but actually, these are all our competitors, but actually these are the ones to watch. These are the ones that are really going to take my market share off me. When you know who they are, you need to understand what it means to be their customer. Now, that's, that can be quite difficult to get to speak to their customers, but I'd really try if you can. You know, it depends on, you know, if, if for example, uh, my competitor was Marks and Spencers, um, it's dead easy to find those customers everyone on shops and marks and spencers. But and again, if you're a legal company, you know, you need to try and find people who use them because you need to know what are they really good at? Where, why, why do you use them? What, what do you find that's really helpful about what they give you? Um, and also, what do they not do really well? Because then you can start p putting yourself against them and working out, well, actually, they don't do this particular, but I could do that really well. Um, and once you're in that mindset, you're in a very really strong position to um, exploit opportunities and gaps in the market. And I'll, I'll just give you a, an example of how um, an SME did this really effectively. I um, Last year, I worked with a company called Provisimo. So I don't know whether you're familiar with them, and um, but they're a lingerie company and talking boobs, and it's not even now. <laughs> uh, so that's a bonus you weren't expecting. They're a lingerie <coughs> company, and they've got 22 stores across the UK, and they they basically um, they compete with the likes of Marks and Spencers, uh, Debenhams, independent uh, independent boutiques, but they appeal to to women who have got like a deep pocket, so you know, uh, bigger boobs. And uh, what's going there? I mean, I've, got a, I've got a visual there. I'm writing and joking. So um, they have identified that the gap in this market was, and they've done some research, and they, they knew that 80% of women were wearing the wrong bra size. So for those of you who don't wear bras and haven't had a fitting for a bra, uh, how it normally works is you'll go into the likes of Marks and Spencers and a lady, nice lady who hopefully with warm hands will get a tape measure and she'll measure you there and she'll measure you there and she'll go, right, you're a 34 D or a 34 C and you're like, oh right, okay. So you go around, pick off your bras off the thing, off the thing, off the thing or try them on and then you think you're good to go with bad bras and what. Actually, that is <coughs> totally wrong. And for Abyssimo, who who are all about the fitting, say, oh, we can't believe, you know, women have been wearing bras since 
what they're 11, 12, you know, I'm in the 40s now, 20 years on, uh, I'm a bit. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm still making the same mistakes because I don't really know how a bra is meant to fit. I just think that I've been told what the size is, so that must be the size. So actually, they said, no, that's not right. So what they do is they'll get some, uh, get a lady and have a fit and go, right, try that on. And they'll look at it and go, well, that doesn't work. They're probably bulging out here and go, oh, no, that's not right. And different styles of bra are different sizes. So, you know, a lady could be a 34D in, a, in, in one style, like a balconette, and she might be an E in a different style because there's different cuts and there's different ways that they can uh, fall foul of, um, you know, bra. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the challenge that Bravissimo faced was very, very real. They've got 22 stores. So Marks and Spencers have got over 400. So already they're at a disadvantage because in terms of convenience, why the hell would I travel 10 miles to go there when I can go to there in half a mile and I can get there? So there was a big educational thing to say about, well, you might go half a mile there, but do you know what? You're not going to get properly fitted and your bra's not going to fit. And, you know, that's the reason to travel. So the response that we came up with Bravissimo, and this was the most fun I've ever had in the morning, <laughs> I have to say, is <laughs> identifying um, the hook was, we called it well, boob school. You need to come to Bravissimo's boob school. And Bravissimo's boob school is essentially you need to go for a fitting at Bravissimo, and they will give you a seminar in boob school by teaching you how a bra should fit, and then you'll, then you'll know for the rest of your life. And we identified seven bra faux pas, and this died. So we have the quadra boob, number one, which is the four boob job. So it looks like you're actually packing four boobs into a two boob holder. Um, we've got the super drooper, which is, uh, uh, well, anyway, we're on there. I don't need to do all this. Uh, we've got the ledge, you know, we rest your dinner plate on that, on our nose. Um, we've got the side boob village thing, we've got the high rider where the, 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 uh, back, the strap at the back goes far too high, not good. We've got saggy cups and we've got the big standoff which is where they're just sort of, you know, look like they've had a row. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the, the crux of the campaign was basically, if you have or are falling or displaying one of these bra faux pas, you really need to go to boob school because your bra doesn't fit you. And 80% of women are, are, have got this problem. So, what we did is essentially, uh, that, that campaign ran, <coughs> we ran online research to ask people, do you want, have you, how many of these bra faux pas have you committed? Uh, where do you live? Um, how old are you? Um, etc. And what we came up with was through online research, which was last year, so it was 2013 women, oh no, it was 2012, sorry, so 2012 women were surveyed on an online survey. And we came up with some really good data. So, yes, 80% women are wearing the wrong bra size, the seven, the seven main bra faux pas, um, women in the northeast are the worst culprits of quadruple, by the way. Um, women, and, and we had great fun dissecting this data and creating something that was really good fun and perfect actually for Bravismo's um, clients who are real women, don't take themselves too seriously, like a bit of a laugh. Um, so, ra 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 you know, so we thought we were onto something. So we, we, the press release basically was timed not absolutely intentionally to coincide with the Brits, so not after beautiful, because we know, I know every year from watching the bra, you know, Carol Baldwin has about eight, and there's only seven, you know, bra going past displayed at one time, it's fabulous. So I thought, well, the fodder that we're going to get here from celebrities walking up the red carpet and posing will be fantastic. So we sent this, we sent this uh, press release out and our, our findings, we had our launch event uh, before it. And lo and behold, Carol appeared in one of the uh, one of the pieces of covering in the Mail Online, and the, you can see on the Mail Online there. I know it's small, but um, top left, they've got a lot of illustrations there. And they, 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 they. So really, what we did is we gave we gave the tabloids and even the Telegraph, I don't know what, um, 
the opportunity to show a celebrity who they knew was going to attract interest and marry up a story which related to it. But really, that Bravissimo were an SME. Uh, this didn't act, this won, this won an award actually, but it was the best award on a small budget, so it wasn't a big budget. Um, and all it took really is for them to be brave and think, you know what, I've got something that these big companies haven't got, and I've identified an opportunity in a gap, and we can have more fun with this, and we can get, you know, we can, we can, we can get traction from this. So yeah, a great idea. It doesn't really necessarily take big bucks to launch. It often just requires guts and a commitment to go, do you know what, I'm gonna go for it. And why should that be the domain of big businesses? Small businesses can do that if you know your competitors, if you know your customers, and if you're in a position to identify those gaps and weaknesses. Um, this, this campaign um, got 180,000 pounds of estimated average value of PR coverage. Uh, fittings were up by 30, 23%, and the return on investment was 260%. So again, small businesses say to me, oh, we can't afford to do marketing. And you're right, nobody can afford to do bad marketing, and it's really, really, really easy to waste money on stuff that isn't going to do anything. And the difference is identifying <coughs> what is an opportunity and what is a waste of money. But this was an investment for them, and it returned and it paid dividends. Um, and, and also, I thought that the best thing for me is uh, a, couple of, a couple of weeks afterwards, I was actually in Devon, it was an over the tunnel. It was recent research has shown that 80% of women are wearing the wrong bra now. Like, oh my god, that's all the research. Um, so, no, no, um, no problem, no flattery. Like, uh, that's it, so that's it. Thank you very much. Um, so, thirdly, then, I don't know how to do it for time. Hopefully, I'm not doing too bad. Uh, how to make your customers feel super special. So, like I said earlier, <coughs> smaller businesses, by nature of their size, are closer to their customers. Right? And you've got the opportunity to take advantage of this, move at pace, you're much quicker on your feet and can be from, from, from bigger businesses. Um, you know, bigger businesses will spend tens of thousands of pounds on research trying to understand and we'll get to know their customers. And for small, be small, medium-sized businesses, you can like just ask them. You know, you can you know see them. You can speak to them. Um, you can just have that communication on an ongoing basis, and that is like huge or hugely important to know what they're thinking and how they're doing. Um, also, what I, I find often with small, medium-sized businesses is, well, all businesses probably. Um, they tend to only think in terms of a one-way communication. So I've got something to sell, or tell you about what I want you to buy, and I'm going to tell you about that. Now obviously that needs to be obviously part of your marketing communications. But you're not really making people feel special about themselves about that, or feeling like you really care about them or that you've got value added. So you know, don't just call me like you want to buy them or something. There's nothing more in the way than a friend going. And you're sort of holding your breath going, yeah, what, what, what is it you're asking me for here? Don't be one of them businesses because you don't need to be. Um, you know, it's little things. Like I was speaking to an estate agent last week and we were talking about, um, you know, they're obviously in the heart of the community. Um, and they think just, uh, they don't actually, they're broad thinking, but typically they're thinking about getting, um, getting more uh, valuations booked. Um, uh, how many more new properties have got on the market this week? So they're very, you know, they're in that space, they're all consumed by what they're doing, which is on the all. So I'm saying, you know, why don't you think about rather than the business that you're transacting on at the moment, you know, those people that you're currently buying and selling houses for, um, they'll probably be in a position to be moving again within 10 years. Um, and if they're not, they're going to know a whole load of people. And therefore, they go ask their friends, who did you have your house on the market? Who did you have your house on the market? And they're in a community, and people talk, and that can work massively to their advantage, or if they're not very good, massively to their disadvantage as well. So, things like that, you know, why, I, I, you know, I, I, I said, why, why, do, why, do, why do the estate agents not do things like have a, a first night in new house survival kit? You know, so when they pick up their keys, go, here, 
is your pint of milk and your packet of biscuits and you and your voucher for Domino's pizza. You know? <laughs> and they're in the community and those businesses are all looking for the same person to go into their stores. And why don't you get together and say welcome to the welcome to the neighborhood, hope you have a good night, you know, how it's now you're getting on and the next next year, a year to the day that they've moved in, little car going, what a difference a year makes hope you've enjoyed your first year in your new house. And as that estate agent, there's nothing in it for you sending that initially, because they haven't got a requirement probably, maybe they have, to buy or sell their house. But you know what? They're going to go, oh, that's nice, isn't it? Oh, well, that's nice. And it's all those, oh, that's nice, no, that's nice. Thing. That is what is going to get you that business back. And that is what's going to turn a customer into an advocate. So that's why you need to make your clients feel special, your customers feel special, not just when you're dealing with them, but when they're not the customer, because to be honest, that's the easier sell. When you, when people know that you haven't got an opportunity to sell them, the defences are much more down and much easier to build a relationship with. So, going on to the next point, then, does my brand look big in this? Uh, I can't have that. Um, <laughs> mind the gap. You know what? What I mean about this is a small business. Any business is going to be judged initially in, I'll just go on their website and see what they look like. We've all done it, we've got a lot of those, so we don't have a look at them. And it, it's really, really harsh that, because that business could have been going, and probably as and most boards I work with, established really, really, really good businesses, know what they're doing, great relationship with their clients. If you ask their clients why they use them, they'll have a list of testimonials and compliments. And then they have a really rubbish website that says small fried, not really um, up to date. Uh, you know, and I'm like, oh my god, you're doing the hard bit, you're doing the hard bit. You, 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 you're delivering an amazing service to the people that you work with. And the easy bit, which is like telling that story or walking the park, is, 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 is like this often, not always, but often. So when I'm saying mind the gap, where is the gap in your marketing? If you look at what you do as a business and you're up here, where's your collateral? Get people to look at it and go, what does this brand say about you? What, what, what's, what impression are we giving? Because sometimes you can do that internally, but sometimes you need to take it outside of business and know what does it say to you? You need to identify what's your gap. And, then in, and actually, ideally, if your business is here, you need, your marketing needs to be here. Because there's no point promoting yourself for the business that you. Well, I'm saying there's no point. Ideally, there's a, there's a, there's, you, know, you want to be promoting yourself for the business that you are. But really, you want to be promoting yourself for the business that you're intending to become in five years' time. So in terms of the sophistic, you know, how how you look, and that's not difficult. Um, you know, it's, it's it's just a matter of considering considering stuff. What's in your brand arsenal? And like, you can't you can't play around golf with one club. You know, often small medium sized businesses will say, Well, we've got a website, and what else have you got? Not, you know, maybe nothing, or maybe loads, or maybe what you've got is irrelevant. It's because what you're trying to think of is, Right, they're the people I would be my customer, and this is the communication process that I need to go through. This is the sales process. So I'll go to a meeting and I'll have a presentation with them if we're talking business to business brand. Then well, they'll need some sort of proposal follow up. Then, um, Mm, they'll, they'll, they'll probably need some sort of ongoing communications during the marketing campaign to make sure that they know me and don't forget about me. They, so you need to plot out what does that sales process look like, what are the touch points that you come into contact, what are your touch points, and then lay them all on the table. Is there anything on the table to start with? Um, and then what does, it, what does it look like? Because you need to move them as long as that as easily as possible. So yes, you need a website, absolutely you need a website, and it needs to is to tell people very easily and very succinctly what you do and how you can help them, not just what you do, how you can help them to so put yourself in their position. Don't make them work too hard to understand how they can access your help or why your help is that relevant to them. And then again, you move on to the presentation. Well, does that look like the website? Because it probably should do. The styling needs to be consistent. And then, you know, you, your brochure. Do you need a brochure? Maybe you don't. Maybe it's a downloadable PDF, but you need something as a, as a means when people say, Yeah, can you send me some information? And how many people have gone, Yeah. Um, so think about that. And the good news is, you are in complete control of the 
perception that you can create for your brand, you completely control that. So if you want to be seen to be one thing, you can you can be seen to be that thing because it's just about creative and more considered design and, and thinking about your content. So have a cohesive look and style. Um, so for example, you know, when you lay it all out on the table, you want something that all looks like it's gone from the same place from your from your website on the tablet there to your mobile or site or you know, and, and <coughs> I, I, I appreciate that not all businesses have got the budget to get all of these in place all straight away. You might have to pick off your battles on this one. But have a consistent time and when you do get to a point where you create something, it always goes back, it always goes back to that consistent company. And that's a some of the local company. Uh, both of these are local companies that I've worked with in the last couple of years. Um, again, trying to make sure that they look consistent and their touch points are all consistent and they all reinforce the same type of image and message. <clears throat> so finally, adapt and evolve. Um, you know, these are always the flat same five because I have conversations with people every day, by the way. And often it finishes like this and they'll go, well, that sounds great, Lindsay, but God, it's like it sounds like a lot better. Or you'll go, well, um, yeah, but okay, so if I spend that money with you, how's that going to, how, how, what am I going to get back by next week? You know, there are expectations about return on investment in marketing, which you need to have, but you need to, they need to be managed and they need to be sensible. And, oh, gee, that's really good, we're so busy. We just have more time to market ourselves. So that, and, 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 and really, the barriers to effective marketing is, is, is actually really financial, which is why people go, well, we can't compete with people because we simply have more their budgets. On the whole, they are not the barriers that SMEs face in, in effective marketing. They're more to do with, can I be bothered? Because, you know, it fundamentally needs to be doing additional things or things differently, working in a different way, allocating time and resource in a different way. Um, this mindset around, well, we've never done marketing and we did a brochure once and we spent 10 grand on it and we didn't get more businesses off it. And I'm like, what did you do with the brochure? Oh, they're all in that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, okay, okay, maybe, that, maybe that's something to do with it. People think, if I throw money in, I get a load of brochures, old jobs done. It's like me, I pay my gym membership every week, every week. <laughs> it's going to have been for two years, and I'm thinking, it's all right, it's all right, I'm well healthy because I've got my membership card. Um, so you need to use these things. And, you know, the other barrier to it is, and to be fair, some people it is to do with effort and <laughs> and there's a lot of businesses that say, I really want to do it, but you know what? I'm not really sure where to begin or how to navigate this out. I don't know what I don't know. And I know I know there's stuff I need to learn, but I don't really know how to access that help or support. And the good news on that is, even within Liverpool, let alone the North West, there's an industry built around people like me and like Elephant who are there to help you navigate your way through this. And all I would say is just be receptive. Try not to be cynical. People are very, very cynical about marketing. Oh, they're going to send me a sign on website. Or they're going to sell me a brochure. It's going to sit in the room. Like I said, it's really easy to waste your money on marketing. But you need to be more savvy. You need to be, there's things you can do yourself. You need to be tuned into your customers. You need to be tuned into your competitors. You need to know who you're targeting because already you are well off the starting blocks and you can have a conversation with marketing professionals who can then help you guide onto why you have to move forward. And that's really what Agnes was set up to do, which was to help small businesses move forward. Um, and there's, and, there's, and there's, there's plenty of people who are able to help you. So, um, so I hope that's a bit of some interest. In summary, um, basically size is a great advantage. You're quicker on your feet and you can act faster, which bigger businesses simply can't do. Um, you, can st you are close to your customers and you can stay close to your customers um, and your competitors. And if you stay close to both your customers and your competitors and you're all over them, honestly, you're not going to go far wrong. Um, and just mind the gap when you're talking about the communications. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just a
quick note to say that after today's seminar, we will be emailing out the slides from today. So if you're frantically scribbling down bits, don't worry. If you missed anything, we'll send it out later this afternoon, if not first thing Monday morning. Uh, don't worry about that at all. Um, we're going to move on to speak uh, to uh, White Sam. Michelle Billings to speak. Uh, really, really important part of the process is making sure that whatever we talk about here at Think Big is that we're realistic and we're giving you practical advice on how to actually grow your business. And as many of us know, for a startup phase in the first couple of years, access to funding is, is of a paramount importance, especially just coming out of hopefully the recession. And lots of us are looking to grow, whether we're a financially motivated business or whether we're not for profit business, looking to increase fundraising, whatever it is. Getting access to that funding is absolutely key. So, with that in mind, I'd like to invite Michelle to speak to. to. <laughs> speak very well. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Morning. How do you follow that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming this morning. It's uh, cold and early, and uh, really appreciate you all turning out this morning. Really good effort. Um, I'm from the Local Enterprise Partnership. Does anyone know what the Local Enterprise Partnership is? No? Okay. Um, the Local Enterprise Partnership is um, a between the third sector and the private sector, and we basically bid on funding for the Liverpool region, and we are exceptionally good at it. In comparison to regions like Cheshire and other places, there is a lot of funding available in this region because we are um, a deprived area in many ways. Um, it's our job then to um, lobby local government and um, the, the main government and influence policy making and decisions that affect business and the growth of the economic regeneration of this area. Um, and obviously make sure that all the funding is distributed evenly. Um, what does that mean for you guys? It means that we are here to work with you, including SMEs. Um, we now have a program where myself, my job title is, and I hate this term because it makes it sound like I sell insurance, but I don't. <laughs> um, I'm called a commercial broker. And the reason for that is that I'm here to broker you guys into the support and help that is available within this region. So we would initially have um, a chat, about an hour and a half of, of free business advice, um, and then we would signpost you into the relevant organisations where you can get financial help and support and things like that um, within this area. Um, who's been in business for more than three years here? Can you put your hands up? So, just give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> because we've all got through the recession. Um, so, well done. You know, that in itself is a huge achievement. Um, that, you've, that you've trained in during that time and you've trained it out of that time. And that is a huge, huge achievement not to be underestimated. Um, does anyone remember services like Business Link? Yep. Pop your hands up if you remember Business Link. So quite a few of us remember Business Link. Um, there's also other services. Many, many services during the recession were chipped away and they were kind of sneakily done by the government. No one, you never saw it in the, in the newspaper. No one really noticed, but stuff like Citizens Advice Bureau, um, things that businesses relied on in many ways, legal aid, business link, um, all the funds, various different things. So what you've got right now is a little bit of a miserable landscape um, for businesses where businesses, for me, are virgin territory. When I speak to um, local businesses, many of you have not had any interaction locally, you don't really know what the chain was for, you don't know what help and advice is out there. And that is our job to signpost you and direct you into the right places and make sure that you're getting everything that you're entitled to, basically. And, it, and it's not just free money, as, as it were. Um, that it, you know, there's more of a process than that. But we're on your side during that process as well. Um, has anyone here actually benefited from government funding? Can you put your hands up? One, two, three. Um, yeah, great, okay. Um, can I 
ask you a bit about that process. Did you complete maths and paperwork? Was it hard? Was it arduous? Did you have to, um, yeah, there was a lot of audit, a lot of, you know, those forms were sent back, this and that, you know. Um, and it's still ongoing three years later, oh, reports yeah. on you know, what we're now doing and how many people have still got employed and were employed then through the grants. And, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's, so worth it. it's, no, it's still worth it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just like to personally blow apart those expectations um, because everybody is put off um, applying for funding through the government because, because of those things. And our process is very light touch. It's a quick scheme. It's, it's very, very minimal paperwork. You're not jumping through hoops and fire hoops and all sorts of things. You just, um, we're guiding you through that process. That initial meeting is not one off. We're there for you right the way through the process. And we've actually got a lady who works full time just to get you through that process. And there's constant contact, really working on your side. And if there's any you know, new holes to get through and you know, fill in the paperwork incorrectly, we're there to help you with it and guide you through it. So I don't want you to be put off that, that process, really. Um, I'll try and uh, stick a little bit more to the slides, and that's me. <laughs> um, just told you a little bit about the LEP. Um, business growth is our aspirations, as, as we've said. Um, and, and why, why um, do we want to grow businesses? What's our overarching um, objective for the region? Um, there's some very, very interesting key facts about this region, Liverpool. Um, we cover the five and sometimes the six boroughs of Liverpool. Don't ask me to name them because it's too early in the morning. <laughs> um, but Basically, we cover this whole region, and um, we are, are fighting on all fronts against things like social deprivation and um, worklessness and unemployment and things like that. And the only way that we can overcome that is to create jobs. So we are all about stimulating the economy and growing businesses in whatever way possible to create jobs in this local area. And that is through um, helping them grow and helping businesses to become strong and being on their side and helping them with these processes. Um, Liverpool region has got a, a appalling statistics when you can compare us to virtually every city in the UK, in particular the North Cities, we are the underperforming city for almost all aspects of business, in particular um, women in business. Um, the amount of businesses per capita, um, many, many statistics that make this a region that is really high and we are on the agenda for the government, and that is why we're fighting on the front, basically. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to be here to talk about the New Market Fund, which is my um, the fund that I work on, which is distributing um, business funding for local businesses. As a LEP, we had a choice about how we distributed funds. We've got a pot of about a million pounds to distribute in this region. We could have given the business advice ourselves, but we decided, we elected not to do that. We felt that that business advice was best coming from the business community. So if you need legal advice, don't, don't ask me, because I don't know anything about legal advice. Go to a solicitor. Go to a, a registered, insured, legal professional with a, a background and a, a pedigree in that, in that industry and get proper advice that you're entitled to and we will reimburse you 35% of those costs. I'll tell you a little bit more about how that works. Um, the eligibility is that you are an SME, so up to 250 people, you're in a B2B um, industry and you're located within one of the five boroughs of Liverpool. Um, this is the 35% contribution. So whatever you're looking at growing your business, if you think about your business objectives within the next six months, really think hard about those. And ironically, most business objectives do fall into the category of business growth. So if you put an asterisk next to the ones that fall into the category of business growth, most of those services will be eligible. So even legal advice, investment readiness, um, 
procurement, service of services, even procurement advice, um, marketing, even websites. Um, so you could get 35% towards um, the cost of any marketing services, you know, graphic design, any of those things. Anything that helps you to get into a new market or helps you to reach a wider audience of people or diversify your products and services as well. Um, you must be competitively procure the services, so you do have to get through quotes in order to qualify. And you know, really, my advice to you would be saying that if you are a small business that's spending twenty thousand pounds, you should be doing that anyway. You know, no one should just spend the money randomly without testing the market and considering what you know what's that worth in the market. And you know, if you go and you make around the corner, you never know. Am I getting good value for money? So we're advocating good business practice is best practice overall. Um, and it's a good education for small businesses as well to get into that, that habit. Um, we help you, as I said, with all the uh, paperwork and everything. There's, a, there's an awful lot of services, you know, really dig down, deep down into this list and we will help you write the bid, um, which is only two page registration. Um, to, to make sure that you that you are eligible, that you qualify for these services. You know, there's certain things that we genuinely can't do, but if we can push it a little bit or write it in a in a way that it works well for you, we'll do that. And um, here's the uh, team, and uh, we are looking to get another four commercial brokers in the local region. Um, that will be placed and working in partnership with our local partners. We work um, collaboratively with um, the local chambers of commerce and the local authorities and various other agencies that we refer and um, work into. So we're a partnership organisation. And here on our team, we all have our own specialities as well. Um, so, say for example, um, Paul is the banking guy. If anyone knows how to get money out of a bank, it is Paul. He's worked 20 years in banking and there's nothing he doesn't know about banking. Um, Steve Smith is your investment guy. And if you need investment, we've actually got um, a new resource called the West Coast Investment Hub. Um, and the are developing a product where you pay a minimal fee to get you through that investment process because we want inward investment into the region and we want that to come into your business. Um, Janice is, is a bit generic with a very long standing history of, of business advice and business support. And myself, I'm very heavily biased towards sales and marketing. Um, and if you do have a meeting with myself and all you want to talk about is investment readiness, you've drawn a short straw. Um, and I will refer you to Paul or Steve because I, I want you to get the best service. Everyone <coughs> wants you to get the best service that you can. Um, your hour and a half of the, that first initial consultation is, is a very, very valuable and meaningful business time for you. And generally, you can add a lot of value to your business during that time. It's a really deep conversation. We make a lot of introductions for you, typically five, six introductions from every meeting of programming and support for you. And the nicest part of my job is that you see people a bit uptight during that first conversation. And then by the time that, that the end of that meeting comes, they're smiling, they're happy, you can see their shoulders sagging, they're relieved, they, they just feel like they've got someone on their side. And that it's that overwhelming feeling when you're a business owner that you know you're in it on your own and you're constantly just pressured and you know and to have someone on your side who understands who's fighting your corner is, is invaluable in many in ways and that's exactly what we're there for. Um, I'm going to try and keep to time so I'm going to whiz through the next slides which I want you to uh, to know about. Um, advice finder is a way that you can procure and find local services within the region. Um, in a nutshell, what I would like to say to you is, in terms of giving yourselves an advantage in the local region, please do register your services on Advice Finder. Um, who here provides a B2B service giving advice and support to other businesses? 
you, you all need to do this. Um, so, you know, make a note of, of the, uh, the, the address and um, get yourselves registered on there. Um, it's really simple registration process. And once you've done it, you know, you're open to the, the whole of the business community. There's, there's a lot of people being directed to it at the moment through local authorities, etc. You are all looking for services and quotes from this region. <coughs> so it's like a um, prompt-you sort of procurement website, um, but not as formal as that, but there's no reason why you should get requested quotations through that website. So um, I'll quickly run, run through how it works. It's like a matchmaking system, helping you find the right support, in partnership with all these agencies, authorities, etc. Um, asking you what business advice you need, so you can literally put in um, a question or what, what sector you're in. Um, Specialising to, to, to different specialities. It works in a system that is really niche and it's got this clever um, algorithm thing inside it. <laughs> <laughs> sketchy there but um, the more you niche in, in marketing terms a niche of a niche of a niche basically really really focus down so really put what your speciality is um, and what help you want in all these searches and everything um, it's a bit like LinkedIn where you get a bunch of uh, you put in a search and you get a bunch of profiles like this and then you get your actual profile that you need to fill in so you've elected to do it on the person because we feel that good, good business advice through professionals comes mostly from people. Um, so it's a good way for you to build your local profile and um, build up build the business profile and a bit of free PR as well. Um, there's also other resources that are available to you on there, um, which is our procurement template, which is what we use ourselves for the New Markets Fund for you to actually get products and services from the community. Um, business plan template um, and advice kind of resources. There's all sorts of um, business resources on there. Um, that's the the domain for you. As I say, get get on there and register. Um, make sure you complete that profile and then you're ready to trade in the, in the local area. And this is going to last a long, long time. Once you've done it, you've got that profile ready for the next few years. <coughs> Ready to say the business community. Um, does anyone have any questions for you? Any questions? Can I just ask, is the funding, does it have to benefit the local community or can it be an online um, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, anything that, you know, even if you trade and you bring in revenue from different parts of the country, that's even better for us um, because what we don't want is companies that only trade in Liverpool. <coughs> It's, it's just a displacement of um, funds, if, if you can imagine that. You, you know, if you trade in Liverpool, you could potentially put another business out of business if you do well. Whereas if you trade in London, you're bringing in money from another region. And so do you service the world as well? Yes, yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, is there any sort of guidance on something like, if you've had a grant within the last three years, can you not have another grant? Yeah, there is. Because yeah. I know most of the council will have a grant from as well. They, a lot of theirs, you can't access funding if you've had help in the last three years. Yeah. We're so looking to expand, and it's less than just less than three years right. since we lost the time for grants. Um, there are, there are, the conflicts are very, very small. Very few services that you can't overlap. With us, you can, you can overlap to virtually any of the service. However, um, if you've had more than um, 200,000 pounds worth of aid in the last three years, that means that you've reached your ERDF limit. Um, there's a lot of you know, European lot guidelines of and things like that. But if you're nowhere near that, absolutely, you know, fill the boots. There's so much, so much European aid um, that's available. Um, is there any that towards capital expenditure? There is um, there's a government scheme um, that is the, the local version of that government scheme is running quite low. It's coming towards the end of that um, that phase. Yeah. But um, the scheme that you're looking for is the um, it's either called the business growth grant yeah. or the the RDF. That's what I have just less, but it's coming up to three years as a sentence. Right. Yeah. 
I mean, that, that one, the government one, which you would apply through the central government website, that one is, is still available. Um, but because it's a capex investment, you do need to get your business plan really hot off the mark because of the, the deadlines on it and uh, make sure that you go through the process really quickly. Um, and I think it's going to be great it's about 20% um, put, put to it. Um, but there's, there's lots of different things, you know, if it's not for asset and capex purchases, um, you know, say if it's for building, there's the Christmas fund, there's, yeah. there's all sorts I've got of one different. at the moment, it would be too specific, but I've got one, I want to alter my premises to enable uh, disabled people to access it. Uh, because it's hard at the moment to get a lot of complaints. Yeah, we're opening the new market, so the new market for me to do yeah. And yeah, any of those costs, you could, there's things that we could help you with. with that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, lots of companies do it in lots of different ways. They have pyramids and structures and circles. We call that brand pyramid. And we, we basically simplified it down to four parts. The first part is your principles. This underpins the entire brand. You need to know what you stand for, what you believe in. Pick three principles. Make sure that uh, every single member of the management team, especially, believes and lives those principles every single day. Don't ask your mind you can't remember. But you have to have those principles that under brand, underpin everything. You need, then you need to establish a personality. How are you going to communicate with your target audience, your customers, competitors? Is it friendly? Is it professional? Is it outgoing? Is it, is it bubbly? What is it? Pick a personality and stick to it. Don't create one, pick it based on the people you've got in the business. Particularly the management team, but yes, the entire business. The proposition is your promise to the customer. I promise I'm going to sell you this widget for this price, but it's really, really good. It's got added value, it's shiny, it's beautiful. Whatever it is, whatever that promise is, that's the, that's the second to last thing you need to do. Make sure you've got a promise. And finally, sum it all together in what we call the brand essence. The brand essence is basically a quick way of saying this is everything about us. This explains us in less than five seconds. At Elephant Digital, we call it make an impact. That's our proposition as well as our, our essence. We promise to you we're going to make an impact. Whatever we do, whatever service we provide for you, we're going to make an impact. We're going to make an impact for you and your customers in the website or the brand exercise that we'll do for you. That's our proposition. That is our brand promise. That's our brand essence. My top tip for this, do this with your team. Don't do it with the management team, do it with everybody. Sit them down and ask them these four questions. Right guys, what are our three principles? Just like we did with the, the um, IT telecom company. And the whole room will go, um, fun, uh, dancing, whatever it might be. Go through this, do it once. If they can't answer all those questions succinctly, then do another session and say, right, let's work out what, what our values are, what our principles are, what our personality is. Get them written down, get everyone to agree to them. Put them down on paper, put it up on the wall. It can be an evolution, it doesn't have to be a one-off. You can keep doing it every year, every six months, wherever it might be. But live it and breathe it every day is my message to you. Do the process, believe in it, live it and breathe it every day. Don't put a load of stuff up on the wall you don't believe in. It doesn't work. People won't believe it when they walk in and go, do you really believe in it tomorrow? This is Jed the Dog. He's our head of security. <laughs> really funny. <laughs> He's on our website for anyone who hasn't seen it. Um, we've got all our pictures in there. Jed's a... Jed's a one of my business partners at German shop and he was that size about six months ago and now he's about this big. <laughs> but he's a happy little boy. <laughs> your website really, really is so important these days. I'm not going to leave the point that you need a website, whether you're not for profit, public sector, private sector, whatever you do, you need a website. It's your main communications tool. If you're not communicating what you do on your website, you're missing a massive trick. You really are. Lindy touched on it before. Everybody will get on the phone, sell something, and you're there going, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. and you'll Google the company and you go, Likewise, you pick up the phone and you go, and they go, do you know what, yeah, they're quite good. Yeah. These guys look like exactly this person on the phone is talking to me about, or I've met them at a seminar or a meeting. And if you look at the way we've done our brand, for example, everything's in our wonderful album in green, we've got logo everywhere, we've tried to make sure our principles and our personality is consistent across everything that we do, and it works, it really does work. We've had three or four leads in the last month from Twitter. We've had three or four leads from the website, we've had three or four leads from seminars like this, we've done talks, we've done elsewhere. It works, and people just like consistency. They like it all to fit, they like it all to look the same. Inherently, we look for traits, and we look for um, similarities when we, when we speak to people, when we look at companies. Everyone likes to be a nice, neat box, nice, a nice, neat box. So, work on your website, get it looking good. Make sure it's got all these key points on it. Make sure you've built it in mind to convert. It, it's a sales tool. It is a communications tool, but it's also a sales tool. It's trying to help you convert prospects into customers. There's so many tips I can give you about your website. But if you haven't got analytics installed, Google Analytics, get it installed. Ask someone to help. It's really quite straightforward. It gives you some fantastic insights. Get Google Webmaster Tools installed. That's also a really good in, in, uh, tool to use. The final thing is to complete what I call a key audience assessment. And again, people call it many different things. But write down who your customers are, or people who are going to look at your website. Put them in bronze, silver, gold. So we're all gold, <coughs> they are our prospects. What do they want from our website? They want to know who we are, what we do, why they should choose us. When they land on that site, does our site do that? Yes or no? Yes, great, don't come and speak to me. No, give me a call. Give Lindsay a call. It's got to do that. And there's a whole, as you know, a whole process of our building design website that goes behind that. But in essence, that's what you want your website to do. Pay per click advertising. The next thing I would look at for everybody, I seriously would, and pretty much everybody, is look at pay per click advertising. That's the adverts at the very top of Google that you pay for, you pay per, pay per click. It's paid advertising, it's quite straightforward to use. 
there's the obvious benefits of even stock straight away, it's easy to budget, you can optimize and fine tune the campaign. One of the major, the major sort of benefits of doing it is that analytics, Google Analytics, no longer lets you see where your keyword traffic's coming from. Because Google, a uh, ruthless money making machine, they just say, oh, that's all organic now, we can't show you what keywords. Because they want you to pay for AdWords. So let's play them at their own game. Set an AdWords campaign up, run it for three months, get that keyword data. It's important to know how people are finding your site. And that keyword data is the most valuable um, part of, of SEO and PPC. I won't make the point, but you can set up an app for free, you can get some cam cam campaigns going relatively quickly, you can do it all in an hour or so. Google will even do it for you and set the optimization so it makes them more money. Or you can come and speak to someone like us and we'll help you with it. But run a three month trial campaign. Don't run it for a week, don't run it for two weeks, run it for three months. It takes about one to two months for the campaign to settle and bed in, and you want a nice, three, a nice quarterly set of data. Anything less than that, you won't get over the data set. It'll be enough. Once you've got the data, once you've got the research, you've got your keywords, you're thinking, right, these top 10 keywords I know people are searching for, then you can start to think about SEO. Search engine optimization, those who don't know SEO means. There's loads of great stuff we can talk about there, and we're not going to talk about it today. SEO is an ongoing thing, it's a longer term investment. You set your site up right, and you need to do lots of great things like link building, outreach, content plans. Generally speaking, I'd recommend you go and find an agency for that. You're not, it, it's, it's, it's not complex, but it is time to you need to kind of get your head around um, how to do it properly. Top tips for SEO really are use the free tools that are online. Most of them are free, few minutes paid for. Uh, our head of search has kindly given us these. Open Site Explorer, fantastic for understanding your backlinks. You can pet backlinks. Backlinks are one of the key measurements of how well your site ranks in Google. SEO browser actually shows what content Google sees when they scan your site. Fascinating tool, have a look at it this afternoon, it's really, really good. And the AdWords keyword planner tool, which is the title there, that helps you say what keywords people are searching for. So if you're in IT, type in IT Northwest, IT Warrington, IT Liverpool, and it'll give you loads and loads of great ideas of to try this, try this. Use those three tools. Very briefly on, on uh, LinkedIn. Did anyone come here today from a LinkedIn invitation? <laughs> it works. It really works. We've been using LinkedIn. These two here founded it. Not found it, but found some fantastic ideas on how to network via LinkedIn about seven or eight years ago, and they've been fantastic along the show at generating leads and interest from LinkedIn for companies in all different types of sectors and all different types of disciplines. I'm not going to list them, but most sectors it works for. And it's really, really straightforward. You get a profile, you connect with people, and then you send them really, really bespoke messages. You say, hi, John. Great, great, great to see your profile. I love working in the legal sector. I provide legal software. Can we up for a cup of tea? And round the corner. That's it. We do it all the time. We get probably 50% of our work from LinkedIn. It works. You can do it yourself. You can ask us to do it for you. It's quite labor intensive. It's quite boring. But it does work. There's all the great stuff about credibility and brand and uh, you know, handy address, but there are added extra. If you want to grow a business, especially B2B, use LinkedIn. Everyone loves social media. Again, we could talk about this all day, and if you come to the social media masterclass in January, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it's there. Social media is not right for everybody, it's right for most businesses. It works for B2B, it works for B2C, it works great for not-for-profit and charity. Without laboring the point, we live in a very social world now. People like to talk, people like to make referrals, people like to chat, people like to know things that they didn't know before, people like to send things and you know, pass it around. People love to communicate with each other on loads of different platforms, but especially on social media. Hands up anyone here who didn't check Facebook this morning? Is that because you haven't got Facebook? There we go then. <laughs> nice and easy. I check Facebook, my girlfriend will tell me probably about 100 times a day. It, it, is, it is an addiction right now. Um, luckily, <laughs> I'm seeing counselling. And I use the excuse that I run a digital marketing agency, so she can't let me There's so much to do with social. The important thing really is to make us understand a bit more about it. Understand why you're using it. Don't use every channel. Pick the channels that work for you. Exactly the same as the channel plan. Twitter's really, really good. At the moment, we're using it a lot. We've learned to use um, we've learned some really good techniques recently from our head of social over there, Joe. Joe puts a lot of time in understanding social media, 
understanding trends, understanding the way that people talk and communicate online. And just understand that you don't sell on social media. You've got to engage. And it's not it's not a fancy way of saying, you know, don't sell it. It's a genuine um, process that Joe follows when she works with clients. When she looks at a client, she'll normally go right on your Twitter or LinkedIn and Facebook and she said, I'm not gonna post that much. But what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna comment on other people's posts. I'm gonna retweet, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna add to the list, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and engage with people. Joe drags me out to lunch most days around the hall and says, oh, let's go here, we haven't been there before, and I wanna tweet about them. I'm like, oh, right, okay. So she's sitting there tweeting away and she's taking pictures of the fish cake. And people love it every single time they respond. And they always, we get retweets, we get follows, oh, I like independent Liverpool, I like that particular cafe on Oak Street, whatever it might be, they love it. We are focused on Liverpool, our, our social media strategy is to be the people of Liverpool who are embracing and supporting Liverpool. That's basically what we're trying to be, and Joe does a fantastic job. Don't sell. Every now and again, pop something on there about what you do, but don't sell on it. If, you, if you're looking for a sales tool, social media is not the tool you need. Practical tip, set aside 30 minutes every day. We could spend, if, if I let Joe, she would spend 40 hours a week literally developing the Elton Digital social media channel. And she shouts at me many days because I say, no, you have to do other work. You've got clients to service, you've got to go out, you have to breathe and eat and stuff. But she can spend all day every day. The challenge is, have you got all day every day? If you haven't, come speak to us. If you have, great. 30 minutes each day should be enough to get yourself going. Choose the platforms you want to do. Talk to people every day. Respond to things. Use imagery. Use video, it's great. We're going to put these videos on our social media channels next week. And loads of the pictures, thank you, Tom. It works. Game with the fist. I'm just going to sort of finish off really about why it's important to find a good agency. I've been client side, I've been group marketing manager for a, a big company. I had to procure web design. SEO, PPC, a few other services. I spent three months going around the Northwest, meeting every single type of agent I possibly find. The job was great fun, really, really good. I'm now on the dark side, I'm back on the agency side, so I've got a bit of a, a, a double-edged a double, a double -edged knowledge. If you're gonna find an agent, you're gonna use an agent, find the right one. Don't come to us if we're not the right fit. <clears throat> fit is so important, we call it the three date rule. Every, every person we meet, we say, right, this is the first of three dates. First date is just, you know, getting to know each other, seeing if we might fit. Second date, we start to talk a bit more seriously about the project and the, and the process. And the third date, you can imagine that for yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you've got to choose between a full service agency who does everything, or a specialist, a group of specialists. We do a bit of both. We tend to focus on brand website communications. There's some things we outsource, like photography and videography. And a few other bits and bobs, but generally yeah, we can do everything. It's got to be the right fit. I would definitely go to the local agency. I would focus on value instead of cost. Don't go in thinking I've got 10 grand to spend. Go in thinking these are the things I want to achieve and get three quotes. If all three of those quotes come in at 20 grand, your, your, your model is wrong. And you might go back to your boss and he goes, tough, great, but at least you've got proper effective quotes giving you value for money. And for God's sake, that's their advice. These guys have been in business for a long time, they know marketing, they deal with clients every single day with all the same problems that you'll all have, just in slightly different ways. Ask for advice, don't be afraid to say, do you know what, I don't, I don't know. What should I do? What's the best thing for me to do right now? Agree, clear timescales. Don't, don't say, I want this done by next Tuesday. Ask them, when can we get this done so it's done well? If you've got a really, really specific deadline, think back. If you think I've got a campaign I need to go live on January the 1st, don't tell them at the end of December. Tell them now and get a 12 month plan in place, I promise you'll get more value for your money. Sign a contract, pay on time. Pay on time is not me asking you to pay on time if you come with us. You will get more out of an agent if you pay on time. You know yourself, your customers. You have customers who don't pay. Do you give them that, 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 that tiny extra bit of added value? We, we obviously. <laughs> and finally, people say to me, what does good look like? What does good marketing look like? And Lindsay made a fantastic start and she went through some really, really strong points about marketing strategy. And it really is a combination of strategy and delivering on that strategy, measuring the results and going back to your boss and saying, yes, I've increased revenue by a million percent. But ultimately, it comes down to understanding your customer, delivering a great product or service, 
be consistent, do things the same way, the same added value, the same high standards, and live your brand values. You've got to live them every day. If you're not living them every day, you haven't got a brand. And finally, keep innovating and improving. Marketing is not about, I've done the marketing. Never do the marketing. Never give someone the job of doing the marketing. It doesn't work. It's a process. It's an evolution. It takes time. It, it, it's never right first time. If it is, you'll be paying double. So that's it, really. That's, our, that's my presentation for today. That's our presentation for Think Big for today. Um, do you have any questions regarding anything I just said now? I think burning. Well, we need to come and speak to you at the end. Um, in terms of kind of next steps, really, we always like to do. Thank you for coming. If you wouldn't mind putting in the feedback form as and when you leave. We do have a social media masterclass on Monday the 26th of January for Fredericks and Hope Street. That's a two hour session purely focused on social media. That'll be the ins and outs, everything you need to know, and there's a lot to know. We need to talk for two hours a day, but I'm doing it on the 26th of January. Will you be sending out an email about this? Yes, that'll go out next week. It's live on event right now, so if you want to go and register, you can go and register now. Um, and the next big, big event, as in one of these events, will be in February. We've already got a few speakers lined up, but if anyone's got particular interest, it's got a sales and marketing twist, by all means, come and let me know at the end. I would, I would definitely say speak to Michelle if you're looking for funding, if you're looking for marketing strategy, go and speak to Lindsay. If you're looking for anything else to do with digital or tactical planning, come and speak to me. If I have a very nice day, we'll see you soon. Thank you.